Thank you for coming. Wow, that, that silenced everybody. <laughs> um, thank you for coming to uh, the History Department's annual web lecture. And our web lecture is also sponsored by the Humanities Forum, which is part of the Drescher Center for the Humanities here at UMBC. Um, I want to give a little shout out, uh, some PR for the Drescher Center. Um, their next event is on, ooh, this is really loud, isn't it? Tuesday, November 15th. Um, it is called Mill Stories, Remembering Sparrows Point Steel Mill, Film Screening and Conversation. So we'll get to hear a little bit about Michelle Stefano and Bill Shrowbridge's um, project. And there's a lot of feedback on this. Do we still have the AV person? He just walked away. Hello. <laughs> oh, there he is. Brian, he's Can I just there. Just turn it off. Apologize, everyone. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Bob Webb since this lecture is named after him. He was a member of the history department um, here at UMBC, much beloved. Can you hear me, or is that just too crazy? No. <laughs> um, Bob Webb was born um, in 1922, and in his youth he was actually a pianist, but then he switched to history, which people often do, right? Um, and he enrolled as an undergrad at Oberlin, and his college career was cut short um, by, or interrupted by World War II, like it was for many young men. Um, he came back from the war, finished his studies at Oberlin, and then went on to Columbia University, where he studied 19th century British history. Um, he received his PhD in 1951, went to Wesley, oh, there we go, went to Wesleyan, thank you, um, and taught for a few years, and then also taught at Columbia. Um, the thing about Bob Webb that was progressive for the time is that most British historians studied um, high politics, and Bob Webb was actually interested in studying um, average people, uh, social and, and intellectual movements as well at the time. In his first book, he sought to understand the challenge that a newly literate working class in the 19th century presented, and um, presented especially to an ascending middle class um, who were attempting to impose their values on, the, on that lower class. Um, Bob uh, also worked on religious dissent. Um, he continued this until uh, his, his last work working on Unitarians, and most notably um, his biography of Harriet Martineau. But he maybe was most well known for his really important textbooks in the fields of British and, and European history. Uh, Webb's Modern England, what, did you use Modern England? I did. <laughs> yeah, um, I did. did uh, was just the textbook for all British historians. It's how I first came into contact with Bob Webb and, and his writing. And then he also wrote with Peter Gay, uh, Modern European History Since 1815, which, which many students also remember. Um, he was uh, well known um, for his editorship of the American Historical Review, the premier journal for the American Historical Association. And when he stepped down as editor, UMBC grabbed him up. Uh, we were very lucky to have him come to the history department where he served as chair. Um, he was uh, much revered for his leadership and also his mentorship of younger faculty. He took them under his wing and helped them. Um, turned their dissertations into uh, uh, books of great effect. And so he was um, revered for that. He held almost every prestigious fellowship that a historian can hold. Um, he had ACLSs, two <coughs> Guggenheims, uh, three NEHs. Um, and so uh, his research was, was well known around the world. Um, he uh, retired, um, oh dear, <laughs> in 1992, um, and continued <coughs> to come to UMBC for the, the web lecture, um, and, and himself gave the web lecture, which must be a little surreal to give the lecture that's named after you uh, <laughs> before uh, his, his, um, uh, his decease. And so we still remember him fondly today. Um, I'm pleased to introduce this year's web lecturer, Judith M. Bennett, uh, Professor Emerita of History and John R. Hubbard Chair of British History Emerita wow. at USC. Uh, she also taught before that at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, we're really lucky to have Judith Bennett come um, and speak with us today. She's one of the most important historians of women's sexuality um, in medieval social history in the U.S. today. And um, she's really had a hand in most of the path-breaking scholarship on women in medieval England and medieval Europe. Um, her books are um, so numerous that we would sit here all day and she said, please don't read my Vita. Uh, <laughs> but I want to note, note a few of them for their importance to the field. I know some of our students out there have read her History Matters, Patriarchy and the Challenge of Feminism. 
in which Bennett talks about the relationship between um, the historical profession and feminist theory and how feminist theory needs to be informed by a historical perspective. So she really sees the, the linking of the two. Um, in 1999, she co-edited with some person named Amy Freud, um, Single <laughs> Women in the European Past. Um, and this was a pathbreaking work in a new field about single women. Um, she also wrote um, her second monograph, was, um, which came out in 1996, Ale, Beer, and Brewsters in England, Women's Work in a Changing World, 1300 to 1600. And in that book, she, from a, a medieval historian's perspective, talked about how um, gender matters in different occupations and how um, women are pushed out of certain occupations as they become more valued and more important. And she took brewing as her case study, but you could apply her theories um, quite broadly to many other professions. I often compare this to nurse, the nursing field um, um, today. She's also um, co-authored um, a string of um, uh, equally important, if not nor, more important, articles. Um, her Lesbian Like in the Social History of Lesbianisms, which came out in the Journal of the History of Sexuality in 2000, was one of the first articles to really create a paradigm for how to look at lesbianism in a time period where we don't have the greatest resources or sources and evidence. Um, her uh, feminism and history and gender and history is still uh, um, on the reading list of most um, medieval classes today, as her is her history that stands still, women's work in the European past and feminist studies. Um, those of you who've taken European women's history with me are familiar with, with some of her other works too, but I won't, I won't go through all that. Okay, good. Um, Judith <laughs> is also probably one RV major uh, uh, um, award that his, a historian could But only once. Only one, <laughs> only one, only one, only one, only one. But she is a fellow of the Medieval Academy of America and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society of Britain. Um, more important to me than all of those honors, though, are the fact that Judith was the person who molded me into a women's historian and who was the co-advisor of my dissertation when I was a graduate student, and I really owe her really, uh, you know, unstatable debt, I think, in a lot Thank of you. ways. Um, when I came to Duke University as a graduate student, Judith Bennett was a professor at UNC Chapel Hill, and I took advantage of this, this cross-class um, articulation agreement, took a number of classes with her. Um, she really uh, is one of the best and clearest and most accessible academic writers out there, and Judith taught me how to read, how to think, how to write, um, and how to teach. Um, Judith was, was a, a, a really a popular and well-known Western Civ teacher. How many were those classes? 300 students. 300 students. She would pack them in, those UNC <laughs> football players. Yeah. Um, and they, they loved All them. voluntarily. <laughs> I'm sure there was no culture credit at yeah. all. Um, and uh, I, I think that um, I was really impressed at both her accessibility and her analytical ability at the same moment to meld those two both in the classroom and in print and um, really inspired me. So anything that I do good in the classroom or good on the page is, is, is all to Judith's credit and everything bad is, is of course my fault. Um, <laughs> Judith also taught me that if you're not saying something with which others disagree, then you're probably not saying something. You're not saying much um, that's important. She's always been willing to uh, push boundaries and to say things that are provocative while, uh, while backing those things up very well and eventually. Um, Always with civil discourse, right? Um, and so um, no bullying. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that um, Judith was an activist historian before that was cool, um, and today that that model is something that we um, we cherish, and she really pioneered the way. So uh, today we get to hear a little about her new research on medieval girlhood, and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot. So I'd like to uh, thank Judith and introduce her talk: "Wretched Girls, Wretched Boys." and the medieval origins of the European marriage pattern. Thank you, Amy. Very sweet. I met Amy just about in the year that Bob Webb retired from here, um, the early 90s. Um, uh, so we've known each other a long time. Sort of, I was saying to Amy uh, this morning that I, I think it was before the Clintons were on the national stage. So it's, uh, we've, been, we've been through a, a whole 
generation of American history together. Uh, it's always been a, a pleasure to know Amy and to work with Amy. I don't think Amy could say the same to me because she was my student. Um, and so there were, I'm sure, unpleasurable pleasurable moments, but um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here today and to be at UMBC. Um, I only met Bob Webb once, but every, uh, he, he was a marvelous man. Just uh, He's the sort of person you meet him once and you remember. Um, and I think also what he did at UMBC was remarkable. Um, I don't know if you uh, can appreciate the snottiness of academic hierarchies, but here was a Columbia professor who came to a new campus um, and made a great history department um, and, uh, and did it in a collegial, uh, kindly way. Um, so uh, it's nice to give a lecture in his honor. Um, I'm going to talk about women and girls today. And when I thought about this a few days ago and decided, for example, to wear a pantsuit, um, I thought it would be a happier occasion. Um, uh, it's not a happy occasion to talk about women and girls today. And in fact, I'm going to make it less happy. As you can see, I'm going to talk about wretchedness. Um, but I think that um, uh, while feminism should be celebratory sometimes, and so should women's history, that we have to look the hard things uh, straight uh, in the face and uh, think about them um, uh, clearly. Um, that in fact, uh, there are a lot of unpleasantries um, uh, in the world for women today and in the past, and uh, there are actually a lot of continuities as well. There have been some very interesting articles recently about misogyny. Um, uh, and uh, 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 it's it's uh, enduring place in uh, Western culture today, for example. Um, uh, I think we have to talk about these unpleasant things in order to uh, have strategies for coping with them and for understanding them. Um, so I'm going to be grumpy, but uh, hopefully it won't depress you. Now, what I want to talk about today is. Um, it, is the mic working? Do you need the mic? Is it working? Do I need to stay by it? Did you just lose me, for example? And was that unpleasant? Was it unpleasant to lose me? <laughs> no, I, uh, do I need the mic? No. No? OK, let's get rid of it. Um, I want to talk to you today about women, girls, and economic development. And what I'm going to do is talk at length about a particular historical case that has really interesting parallels in contemporary development theory. So, and, and so um, I'm going to be a historian, but sort of frame it in a sense by a contemporary idea. And so I'm going to begin with the contemporary. And um, the contemporary is about something called girl effect. Um, today, agencies, oh now, first snafu, my uh, thing doesn't work, so I have to Nothing works. I'm going to have to do that. No, OK. Try it now. Thank you. So am I OK? All right. All right. A uh, girl effect. Um, in the, today, um, uh, in agencies promoting third world development, Girl effect is all the rage. Everybody is directing resources at this idea. Uh, for example, the Nike Foundation gives all its money, all its money, and that's a lot of money, um, to girl effect. Um, uh, the idea of girl effect is that if you invest in third world girls, you actually invest in third world economies more generally. So it's actually not an idea that says let's invest in girls because girls are worthwhile in a sense. It's an idea that says let's invest in girls because if we invest in girls, everybody gains. The uh, theory is pretty uh, commonsensical and straightforward. It's basically if you direct resources at girls, they will, and here I'm quoting a, a UN task force, they will, quote, marry later, delay childbearing, have healthier children, earn better incomes that will benefit themselves, their families, their communities, and their nations. It's a great idea. Um, uh, as I said, the Nike Foundation is behind it, the CARE Foundation is behind it, the Sherry Blair Foundation, uh, the Clinton Foundation. You go and um, Google Girl Effect after this lecture and you'll just be overwhelmed by um, all the stuff that's centering around Girl Effect. Money raising and money spending. Now what I want to talk about this afternoon is the historical equivalent of girl effect. And that's the notion that something called girl power, and here's the, uh, a, a, a copy of the first page that developed this notion, that girl power 
uh, fueled the growth of Western Europe in the modern era. So again, it's girls causing economic development. Girl power is a new word for a very old idea. The idea started 50 years ago when a statistician named John Hagenal drew a line from St. Petersburg down to Trieste, and he said that everywhere west of this line, Europeans married in a very distinctive way, and he called it the European marriage pattern. He said that west of this line, Europeans, uh, there are two characteristics to it. One is that uh, people marry late, both young women and young men don't marry until their mid-20s. Uh, this is particularly important for girls because if girls don't marry until 25, think about all the children they haven't had between, say, 15 and 25. It's roughly about four children, okay? Um, uh, so it, it limits fertility. So the first thing is um, age of marriage, and the second thing is late, and the second thing is that a large number of people never marry at all. They die as uh, single women or bachelors. And I'm talking 10, 15 percent of the population. Now, Hagenal said that this pattern was unique to pre-modern Europe and that just about everywhere else in, in the world, in the pre-industrial world, brides married in their teens and almost all adults married. Marriage was universal. So he pulled out Europe and said, this is a special place. He also gave the European marriage pattern a heavy load of interpretive baggage. He, as, he assumed that it was a terrific thing in both origin and what caused it and also in the effect it had, that the European marriage pattern arose from prosperity and from the prosperous classes. It was well-off parents who first began to delay the marriages of their children, for example, and that it promoted more prosperity, that it fueled the economic growth of early modern Europe. And he also applied that to women. He said, the European marriage pattern grew up in a society where people treated their women well and, as, and it not only rose from proper treatment of women, of, of women it also promoted further uh, develop, uh, improvement in women's status. Hatchell's attitude is classic for European in the mid 20th century looking at a European phenomenon. Basically what he was saying is aren't we Europeans great? We treat our women well, and um, therefore, we're better off than everybody else. Okay, so it's a very uh, self-satisfied uh, theory. In the last 50 years, we've uh, changed all sorts of ideas about the European marriage pattern, but we haven't actually questioned this happy framework. The reigning theory about it today is that it began on both sides of the North Sea, so that it began in the Low Countries and in England. Um, uh, uh, after the devastating plagues of the mid-14th century, after what's usually called the Black Death um, uh, uh, of 1348 to 49. How and why did it start there and, and, and uh, at this time? Um, it works something like this. So many Europeans died in the plague of 1348 to 49, probably about half of the European population <laughs> gone in a year. Okay, so many Europeans died that there weren't enough people to do the jobs that needed to be done. So there was a shortage of laborers. That led to higher wages, what's actually called a golden age of laborers, where if you were a wage worker, you could get good work at a great wage very easily. So higher wages, that meant that women who are usually at the bottom of the wage market were able to compete for better jobs than ever before. And because they're getting uh, better employed than ever before, they decide not to, mar to marry later or not at all. And hence, you have the European marriage pattern. This theory also says, moreover, and this is where you get girl power, the choices these well-paid women made not only kick-started the European marriage pattern, but also set off a, a series of chain reactions that fostered economic growth and, in fact, European modernity. Uh, which is, of course, the first modernity in the globe. Historians, and historians are usually pretty cautious people, but historians have been remarkably incautious um, about talking about what the European marriage pattern did. For example, um, one historian has said that it was the foundation of Europe's early rise to riches. 
Okay. Another has said the European marriage pattern explains the continuing puzzle of why Western Europe gave birth to the modern world. Okay. So again, just let's go back to that map um, and think about Hagel's theory. He's pulling this out, and now historians are saying this is why Europe uh, plunged uh, plunged ahead of China and India uh, and the Central uh, Central America and so on. It's because of this pattern of marriage. It's a huge claim, um, and of course. Uh, another huge claim is simply in, in the title of this article, Girl Power. Um, it's uh, uh, the notion that um, uh, better educated, better uh, paid, less fertile girls fueled Europe's economic growth. Um, I'm going to argue something very different this afternoon. And what I'm going to argue is that women in England, which is the best documented case we have, began to delay marriage or never marry at all not after the plague, not after 1349, but before 1349, in the century uh, before the great, uh, the Black Death, in the century between 1250 and 1350. And I'm going to argue that it was economic hardship, not economic opportunity, that drove the change. Rather than a happy history of girl power, I'm going to give you an unhappy history of wretched girls and wretched boys. Okay, this history is uh, rooted in the English countryside among peasants, uh, roughly, as I said, between 1250 and 1350. Um, and in the century or so, be and, and let me just first of all talk to you about, here's this chart, what I've called on this chart the good old days, um, the time before 1250. Um, in, this, in the two centuries before 1250, um, peasants prospered. Uh, they, it was easy for them to get land, it was easy for them to marry. It was easy for them to raise large families. And population grew accordingly. Um, population estimates for the Middle Ages are always kind of a joke. But um, uh, uh, the best estimate is that uh, between 1086 and 1250, so over the course of uh, 200 years, English population rose from about uh, 1.7 million at the time, say, of William the Conqueror to um, uh, 4.2 million by 1250. After 1250, everything goes to hell. Um, the rural economy began to sputter in all sorts of ways. There are um, harvest failures. I put on here just the first one in 1257 to 8 because it shocked everyone so much. There are also um, uh, diseases of uh, sheep and cattle, which you might think are kind of risible, but in fact are absolutely devastating um, uh, to the rural economy. There are um, many poor harvests. Real wages fall, which means you might still earn a penny a day, but you can't buy for that penny a day what you had been able to buy uh, a decade before. And also rents are rising. Peasants don't own their land. Uh, they're mostly um, uh, renters, and, and they're having to pay more and more for their land. By the 1290s, Things are really bad for peasants in England. Uh, most peasants were poor, very poor. And then it only gets worse in the early 14th century. Um, first, there's what's called the Great Famine. Uh, uh, from 1215 to, I'm sorry, 1315 to 1322, 10 to 15% of Europeans starved to death in these years um, uh, because of bad, uh, heavy rains, bad harvests, and cattle disease. And then things improved very briefly uh, in the decades between, uh, in the 1330s and 40s. And then, of course, the Black Death hits and uh, uh, Europe is completely devastated. So that's economic history in one slide. Um, blame for this century of agrarian crisis is easy uh, to ascribe, and historians spend a lot of time uh, debating it. Um, uh, we can talk about rapacious landowners, uh, lords and ladies who charge too much for rent. We can talk about greedy kings who charge too much for taxes. We can blame peasants who had too many children. We can uh, uh, do arcane things like talk about shortages of silver and gold, which affected the uh, supply of coin, underdeveloped markets, climate change, um, uh, depleted soils, and perhaps most fun of all at the moment, a volcanic eruption in Indonesia in 1257, which actually does seem uh, to have affected uh, the climate, at least for a few years. Um, and that's obviously fun to, tr has been fun to track and uh, to theorize about. 
Whatever the causes for this problem, I don't care about the causes. What I care about is what its most acute manifestation, and that is scarcity of land. There were too many people in England uh, by 1250 for the land that was available to them. Um, and worse yet, this scarcity of land was exacerbated by its unequal distribution, um, which divided peasants into haves and have-nots. At the top were what we might call classic peasants, and I searched the web and came up with a picture of a classic <laughs> peasant for you. And you can see, you know, he's got leather boots and a pouch, and a, uh, he's got a money, um, money pouch. Uh, he's eating an apple, nice hat, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, at the top were uh, peasants who had enough land to survive or even prosper. Um, uh, they had uh, usually 20 to 25 acres of land, or maybe um, as little as 15 acres, which was just enough to get by. Um, they were a small privileged minority in the countryside. This is what you'll find if, if you're looking for an image of a classic peasant. But the truth is, this is um, a small minority of peasants, maybe as much as 25% of peasants. They controlled 90% of the land that was available. Okay? This isn't quite Occupy Wall Street stuff, but it's still um, a, a very a mal, mal, a badly distributed resource. Below them were what we call smallholders, um, about 50% of peasants, half of the peasant population, um, who divided the remaining 10% of land among them, which meant that a lot of smallholders really held very little land at all, just an acre or two, sometimes even less. And they had to survive by combining intensive farming of the little plots of land that they had, together with wage work, and also common rights. Peasants had the right, for example, um, to pasture their sh uh, sheep on common lands or to send their pigs into woodlands. Um, so those were sources of income for them. And also they had to survive on the charity of their better off neighbors. In crisis years, they had to resort to things like thievery, um, sending away their children, and even uh, what we call distress selling, selling what little land they had um, in order to survive. This is short-term smart, long-term disastrous, because then they ended up landless. These smallholders had a grim existence, but theirs was uh, better than the remaining 20% of the rural, 25% of the rural population. I call these people sub-peasants, uh, because they were utterly landless. They had no land at all. They weren't just land poor, they had no land. And they survived by their wages and wits alone. I think uh, Monty Python is actually a better image for these people than uh, that encyclopedia um, picture. If we could walk through an English village in, say, 1290 or, or 1275, I think we'd see both sorts of these sorts of people. We might even see some women, too. Um, uh, but the better sorts were a lucky and privileged minority. And I think that's what's critical to keep in mind. Now this poverty is um, uh, absolutely central to what I want to argue today because scarcity of land, um, uh, I think, explains the development of, um, of the European marriage pattern in this population. And that's because land was a precondition for marriage among these people. Here's an image of medieval marriage with uh, so I was saying to Amy earlier, I love it because they look so grumpy. Um, and uh, I also love the huge ring, um, which is not because medieval artists were stupid, but because they wanted to emphasize the ring um, uh, as a central part of the ceremony. Um, there were lots of things that went into making a marriage, but uh, newlyweds were expected, it was the norm for newlyweds, to establish a new home and a new economic unit. Um, that is so, and to do that, they needed to have land. This is in the jargon of the field called neo-locality. They, they, they moved to a new place to set up their marital household. Now marriage involved in the Middle Ages much more than just getting land and, and setting up a household. Um, priests had a lot to say about how you married and who you married. Uh, manorial lords and ladies did too because they charged some of their peasants a fine for permission to marry. Some peasants were free and some were unfree and it's unfree peasants who had to pay for permission for their, uh, women had to pay for permission to marry, not men. Men could marry as they liked. 
Um, parents obviously had a lot to do with uh, determining how a marriage proceeded because parents would endow their children with the resources they needed. Neighbors gossiped about it and also gave gifts at weddings. And actually, this might surprise you, but even the principals themselves um, uh, by the 14th century were recognized to have a say in their own marriages. Um, uh, 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 the church taught um, uh, that marriage required the free consent of both the bride and the groom. A bride could give her consent from the age of 12 on and a groom his from the age of 14 on. Um, and that's one of the rules that people look at and they think, oh, marriage must have been really early in the Middle Ages if girls could consent at 12 and boys at 14. As you'll see, I think uh, uh, we have evidence that suggests those are absolute minimums. In all these negotiations, though, with priests and parents and all these others, what really mattered was property. And you can see this in the major source we have for the lives of medieval peasants. These are what are called manorial court rolls, which are every three weeks, everybody in a village, you're actually a good size for a village, we'd all come together and we'd discuss all the problems we were having as a community. And it's recorded. Um, uh, uh, in records that we have for England in this period. And then when you look at these manorial court rolls, again and again, what you see is the link of land and marriage. A boy inherits land and boom, he marries. Another man buys land and boom, he marries. A girl gets land from her parents and she marries. A widow gets what's called her dower lands, a portion of her husband's estate that she can keep for the rest of her uh, life. And as soon as she gets those lands, a husband, uh, um, uh, she gets a husband as well. Now before 1250, when land was, uh, uh, population was relatively low and land was plentiful, it was reasonable to ex have this dynamic of land and marriage. Um, reasonable to expect that uh, a new couple would have sufficient land to support themselves and the children to come. What's critical, I think, is that after 1250, with a tumbling economic situation, this expectation endured, you needed to have land to marry, but the supply of land was exhausted. Now, Although both boys and girls grew up aiming to get land and to marry, um, their, their route to that destination differed. It took me years to realize this, and, um, which is kind of embarrassing to admit. But anyway, um, parents, when they looked at their sons and thought about settling them in life, what they aimed to do was get land for their sons and then a wife would follow. What they aimed for their daughters was to get a husband for their daughters who had land. Okay, so w when you're plotting to get your ch children settled in life, it's land you want for the boys and a husband, which means a man with land, for your daughters. And so, to prove my point to you today, what I have to do is um, about the age and frequency of marriage among these people. Um, really, my point depends on how readily young men could get m land and how readily young women could get appropriate husbands. So that's what I want to um, explore for you today. And I found it helpful to anchor these questions in a very specific time and place, which is where I'm going to take you now. The place is a village called, oh, I don't know why that was there, but anyway, um, Weston up here. Oh, dear, I just turned it off. Well, anyway, Weston up there, you can see the red arrow. Uh, in England. It's in a very flat part of England, actually a part of England reclaimed from the sea. It's a tiny village. Um, oh, and I have some pictures here. That's its church, which was, re it's actually medieval, uh, 12th century, but it was uh, redone in the Victorian era and sort of tarted up. Um, and that's the only pub in the town, which uh, uh, has just been uh, saved by a local farmer who claims it's um, the best gastro pub in South Lincolnshire, which I think is kind of a dubious distinction, but um, uh, so it goes. Um, so we're in I'm going to take you to Weston, and I'm going to take you to a particular date, which is 1269. So right, quite early in the century I'm talking about. And that's when a unique inventory was made that went through the village and listed the names of all the serf tenants and then listed their children and told us what they were doing. Um, uh, there's really nothing like it except for this place in this time. Um, and here's, an, uh, here's a page from it. It's in the British Library. And I've circled one entry. Um, uh, and this entry says, John Wiseman has two sons and two daughters, namely, and actually if you're trying to read it, that says Thomas, can you see Thomas? <laughs> and Richard, um, uh, uh, who hold land, and Betta, 
which is Betty. Okay, can you see Betta? Um, who is married in Spalding. And Elena, Helen, who is a vagabond. Okay? Um, there are 55 of these entries, um, uh, dealing with about, uh, t I think, 250 uh, children. So we have uh, 255 uh, uh, parents and what they've managed to do in terms of uh, taking care of their children, or where their children are at this time and place. Now, the r age range of the children in this inventory is very wide. Sometimes uh, the children are described as young, UVNAs. And some, some of the children, like Be Betty, are married. Um, so it's a huge uh, range of several decades of children. I'm going to call them all Generation W for Weston. Um, and here's what their situations look like in 1269. Uh, you're going to see this table again and again, so don't panic. Um, as you can see, it runs from young and living with parents um, down to dead um, and everything in between. Um, this is not a demographically useful t list. Um, you can look at it and think, oh, the sex ratios, oh, they're pretty equal. Oh, you know, maybe we can do something with this demographically. But it's not useful demographically, and you can know that right away because only three children are dead, and uh, infant and child mortality was much higher, are, are reported as dead, is much higher than that. So it's not demographically useful. Also, it's important to remember that Weston is not a closed community. Uh, the people of Weston, uh, where's my Tate, would have moved within about a 15-mile radius of, the of their village all the time, going to markets. They would have married out of Weston and, and so on. So uh, uh, it looks like a closed community, but it's not. Um, what I'm going to use this for is really more illustrative than probative. I think it's really useful to think about this, what it's telling us these children are doing. Um, uh, uh, but you have to think about it pulling in data from other places to fill it out. It's a snapshot, if you will, with all the advantages and disadvantages of that. OK, let's start uh, by considering the sons in Generation W who were successfully married in 1269. There are 25 of them, and as you can see, I've crossed out the two daughters, just because I don't have time to talk about them. There are uh, uh, two sisters uh, who um, uh, uh, were co-heiresses, and actually, interestingly enough, neither of them married. Um, but obviously, although I just talked about them, I'm not supposed to talk about them. OK, um, uh, 25 sons hold, hold land, which basically means uh, 25 sons are married as well, although that's not how the clerk describes it. Most of these 25 sons were born into the upper crust of their village. And I, I have a, a rental so I can look at how much land they held and their fathers held. And I know, for example, that the two Wiseman brothers, uh, Thomas held 75 acres of land. It's a lot of land. Uh, Richard held 35 acres. So these are, these are sons who were very well settled. They're absolutely from that uh, lucky 25%. These 25 sons are also at least 20 years old. And uh, I know that because there is in every village a minimum age to hold land. And um, uh, it's usually 20, 21 years old. At Weston, uh, it's actually stated in the court rolls, it's 20 years old. So all of, these, uh, all of those 25 sons had to be at least 20 years old to be holding land. Um, and that means that the age of 14 years for men to consent to marriage, according to the church, is absolutely moot. No 14-year-old is going to have land, so no 14-year-old is going to marry. Um, so that earlier um, factoid is pretty useless in terms of telling us about ages of marriage. Once a man gets to the age of 20, um, how does he get land? So once he's capable of holding land, how does he get it? Some of them inherited land. Uh, rules vary throughout England, but there's one rule that was, ap uh, you know, sometimes it was the youngest son, sometimes the oldest son, sometimes all sons got land. The one rule that was absolutely always the same is that if, you, if there were any sons, they got the land before any daughters. Um, so uh, Emma and Agnes Ringolf, the two heiresses there, one thing we know is they had no brothers. That's the only way they got land. So it's male inheritance. Sons inherited land. They also got land as gifts from their parents. They also bought land. They would uh, save money from their wages, maybe get loans from people or from their parents, and buy land. There was actually a pretty active market in land. 
And some sons got land by agreeing to support a current tenant and until they died. So, um, uh, where's Terry? Terry, uh, I'm an old decrepit widow, as you can tell, um, and I have six acres. Terry could come and say to me, um, uh, I promise to maintain you and give you three bushels of, of, of uh, wheat every year and one cloth and so on. Um, and I would say to him, okay, I give you my land as long as you maintain me. And so Terry would maintain me, and then as soon as he died, he would be able to hold that land. And as soon as he made the agreement with me, he'd be able to marry. We know about these agreements because they often went wrong. Um, and, uh, there were and the other way that men got l land in this period, and particularly in this period, is they married, um, well actually I just, Terry could have married me as well, but let's not go there. Um, uh, they married widows because widows had dower lands. And after 1350, widows rarely remarry because they're not desirable economic properties. But before 1350, in this land hungry century I'm talking about, Almost every widow, as soon as her husband dies, as soon as she gets uh, her dower lands and enters them, she gets a husband uh, to help her manage those lands. Um, so that's how these boys got land, through inheritance, through purchase, through gifts, through maintenance agreements, and also by marrying widows. However they got their tenancy, these 25 boys Men, I should probably say, but I always think of them as boys. Um, it, 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 anyway, um, uh, uh, we're lucky, uh, lucky boys or lucky men, um, and a lucky minority. If you look at, in this chart at who was likely an adult son, so I guess not a boy, I'll have to start calling them men. Um, uh, all of these, I think, in ecclesiastical careers, employed, living away from home, and vagabonds, these are, I think, grown men. And I think, I have somewhere noted, I can't do math on my own, how many of them are there? Um, I have 32. Yes, let's hope they're 30. Oh, no, they're 32 up there. Um, no, oh, it is also 32. And then we don't know how many of the sons reported as living with parents are actually grown men living in the homes of their birth, um, uh, still living with their parents. So that's an unknown number. So there are in Weston in this period, if you think about men in their 20s or older, there are more men who are unmarried, landless, and therefore I think likely to be unmarried, than there are men who hold land and are married. This means that for many of the sons in Weston, for most of them in fact, the requirement that you had to be 20 years of age to hold land is, is absolutely moot. It doesn't matter. They're 20 years old, they're 25 years old, they're 30, they're 35, and they don't have land. Okay? And therefore, um, in most cases, they can't marry. So what are they doing? First of all, there are a remarkable number of sons going into the church. Um, almost a dozen boys in this, in this village uh, were becoming pre, were either became priests or monks um, and removed themselves, therefore, entirely from the marriage market because in this period, uh, priests and monks uh, were compulsorily celibate. There were fift, roughly 50,000 uh, celibate clerics in England around 1300. 50,000. Monks and nuns, uh, uh, monks and priests. Women, there were 3,000 nuns. Okay, so there's a huge uh, uh, shortfall in terms of lots and lots of careers for men in the church, almost none for women. Other men in this, and uh, here they're represented by category six took up salaried employments. And these are men who are things like shepherds or the prior's servant or, um, uh, um, well, those are the two I can think of at the moment, um, who uh, uh, they're, being, uh, they're, they're working on a, on a yearly salary. They might take a wife, but they don't need a wife to do their job. A shepherd is a lonely occupation. It doesn't require a complex household economy the way being a farmer and uh, cultivating land does. So these men, these men definitely didn't marry. These men might have married, but didn't have to. There's a third option, which is completely obscured in this list, but becomes very important in just a few years for the men in Generation W, and that's soldiering. Um, in 1272, so three years later, uh, a king, uh, uh, 
Uh, Edward I becomes king in England, and he is, to put it mildly, a very bellicose king. He's the English king who conquers Wales and Scotland. Um, and he was very fond of foot soldiers. And every year from, thir uh, from 1277 on, every year, he almost every year, he fielded armies um, that required at least 5,000, but often 10 to 15,000 uh, foot soldiers um, for the season. And so too, into the 14th century, did his son Edward II, uh, um, uh, who you might know from Braveheart. Such a lovely king in Braveheart. Um, they're taking then out of England 10 to 15,000 men every year. Um, that's roughly two men from every parish. So you can think every year of two of these boys uh, being plucked out. Now we don't actually know uh, uh, much at all about how these uh, men were selected, um, uh, but I think it's reasonable to assume that young unmarried men were prime candidates, just like today. Um, and I think we can assume that although soldiers often did go back to their villages, uh, soldiers were at high risk of death um, from illness, from warfare, from accident as they are today. Um, and they're also at high risk to even if they survive to never, never go home. Once they've wandered and been footloose, uh, they might as well wander on. Uh, and we do know some soldiers enlisted for further service or simply settled elsewhere, particularly in the lands that they had conquered. Fourth, um, some sons simply took to the road and left, um, uh, and they s basically sought better fortune elsewhere. And they did this especially in England's newly conquered co colonies, so in Ireland, in uh, Wales, and in Scotland. These colonies offered landless boys good land on good terms, um, uh, and were really appealing for m young men like, I think, the vagabonds noted here. There are eight of them in category nine who had cut their ties to home. I, all I know is that these boys are called vagabonds, but um, uh, uh, I think uh, some of them co could have easily uh, ended up settling in Wales or Scotland, and we know that tens of thousands of men did. They're also in this group, although I didn't create a category for them, scattered in these categories are five other men who are reported as living across the sea, transmarim, um, uh, which is an interesting category. <coughs> these men, who left Weston and found their fortunes elsewhere, probably eventually married. But uh, they didn't marry local Lincolnshire girls. Um, they married uh, Welsh women, Irish women, Scots women. Fifth, there are a lot of landless men in Generation W who really are not nearly as resourceful as these other men. They didn't go into the church or the army or move to the colonies or get skilled employment. They stayed closer to home, and they supported themselves either working with their by living with their parents and working for them in Category 2, or by either living on their own in Weston or living on their own away from Weston, uh, Category 7 and 8. I think most of these men um, were either servants in uh, other peasant households or wage laborers, work getting work by the day um, and supporting, living in small cottages and supporting themselves. They hung around, basically, and they hoped they would get land. A lively widow, perhaps. We can see these men with particular clarity, not in Weston, but in other parts of England, where there are actually fines levied on them. There are actually manors where every year, um, landless boys who are living on the manor have to pay the lord of the manor for the right to remain. These fines are called shivagium garcionem. It means a head tax on boys, basically. Um, uh, and uh, we have particularly good information about them for southwest England, where, there was, uh, where Glastonbury Abbey kept uh, records for decades about the pennies that they took from these boys every year. And they not only uh, took pennies from the boys every year, but the pennies were rated according to how old they were and how much their earning power was. So it begins when they're 14 and they only have to pay tuppence, two pennies a day, and then it goes up as their earning power improves um, uh, into their mid-20s and then begins to decline. Uh, so they might have to pay as much as 12 pennies, I'm sorry, I say two pennies a day? I mean, two pennies a year, up to 12 pennies a year, and then it goes back down as they become old and decrepit. Um, um, about half of the men who you can trace in uh, getting, having to pay this wage, this, this annual tax, about half of them eventually marry. 
Um, so we know that um, their marriages are delayed, but they do eventually um, uh, get land and marry. And how do they get land? They get land by marriage to widows, by gifts from relatives, and by purchase. These are the boys who miss getting land by inheritance. They hang around, they hope for the best, and eventually for half of them, the best happens. But it takes time. Their marriages are delayed, usually by at least uh, 10 years. So we can think of them as marrying more in their 30s than in their early 20s. The other half of these Garcionems, Gar Garciones um, die as boys. They, 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 uh, and, and actually, Garcio is a, a derogatory term in the Middle Ages. Um, uh, so it's meant to make them seem, if you, li if you will, small. These, these men died um, uh, as Garciones. They died landless and wifeless. They're men like uh, Thomas Cuckoo in Somerset, who paid this fine for 40 years, 40 years, until he died. It's noted in, uh, in the record that he's no longer paying the fine because he died a pauper, feeble and blind. Now, men like Thomas might have had lovers. They might have even had uh, de facto wives, women they didn't marry but with whom they lived for a considerable amount of time. But their liaisons, I think, were necessarily informal and economically insubstantial. So what we know about peasant boys then between uh, 1250 and 1350 is this. Some, and let's say a third to one half, I think that's too generous, but a third to one half got land quickly after they reached the age of majority. Um, uh, so, that, uh, like, so they married, uh, they got land and married in their early 20s, um, uh, likely in their early 20s. Some took work that either prescribed marriage or made marriage unnecessary, like the priests and servants and soldiers I was talking about. Some removed themselves from the local scene at all entirely, and if they ever married, married elsewhere. And some simply hung around, um, ho <coughs> hoping for land and laboring in the meantime for their keep. And half of those hangers-on uh, eventually got land and married, but they married late, and half of them never married at all. So that's the boys. Now, if I'm correct about the boys, what I think we should expect to find is a lot of daughters under stress. Every daughter, unless she was uh, a lucky heiress, like the two in the uh, table who I'm not talking about, um, uh, every daughter, what she needed to do was find a husband and his land and therefore marry. If would-be husbands were decamping into the church or to colonies or simply surviving as poor landless um, uh, bachelors, then a lot of daughters were fated to either linger long in their parents' homes or to have to fend for themselves. Well, that's, I think, what we see in this evidence. And I need to go here. Yes. Weston parents were, as I calculate it, roughly as successful uh, by 1269 at settling their daughters as their sons. So you see 43 daughters are married and only 25 sons have land. You might think, oh, well, you know, the daughters are doing much better. But you need to add to that the sons who have been put into ecclesiastical careers and the sons who have uh, been put into uh, skilled professions, uh, like being a servant to the prior or a shepherd. And if you add those up, I think the column for sons adds up to, it does, to 41. Um, and uh, 43 for the married daughters. So it's a, a, a I think we can say parents uh, were roughly uh, equally successful uh, by 1260 in settling their sons and their daughters. But what about the daughters who were not settled in 1269? Some stayed on with their parents. And it's interesting, many more daughters stayed on with their parents and sons. I think that's a, a, an interesting discrepancy. And it's possible, I think, that parents were slightly more inclined to keep adult daughters at home than adult sons. Or if they had a choice, they might have kept an adult daughter at home and sent an adult son out oh, to be a vagabond or something. Although they're equal numbers, essentially, of male and female vagabonds. Anyway, um, uh, certainly some daughters uh, stayed at home. Um, and they were luckier than the other daughters, of whom there are quite a few who had left home, left their parentals' homes, and were living either in Weston on their own, away from Weston, or were vagabonds. These girls um, were on their own. I think they were working as uh, live-in servants, perhaps surviving as day laborers, 
um, perhaps leasing small plots of land to farm. Um, this is a hard life for anyone, and it was a hard life for the boys who had to do it too, but it was harder for daughters than it was for sons. Um, uh, daughters faced more risks. They, uh, they were able to find many fewer paid jobs. They made less money when they did wage work, and they had um, much, much less access to land because land holding was basically a male prerogative. If these women managed to marry, their marriages were delayed, and I think many failed to marry at all. I've managed to track the marriages of uh, some of the 42 women who were living at home with their parents in 1269. Um, uh, um, I have tracked uh, a dozen marriages for those people. It's hard to track marriages. You wouldn't expect to be able to track marriages for all 42. But what's interesting is I've tracked a dozen marriages for the women in Category 2. For the women in Category 7, 8, and 9, I've been able to find no marriages at all. And in fact, there's only one who I've been able to track later at all, and that's Helen Wiseman, who was a vagabond in that first example of, uh, that I showed you. Helen Wiseman, who was a vagabond in 1269, so I think she was at least 15, if not much older by then, nine years later is reported in the Western court rolls uh, for, having, uh, for fornicating, for having a sex while unmarried. So by then, she's at least 25. I think she's probably likely very poor. She's not married, but she's clearly not chaste. I think, uh, I think it's fair to assume that Helen Wiseman is not married, and she would be married if she could be married. The late 13th and 14th centuries are, um, uh, in an odd sort of way, a golden age for landless poor women. Um, and one of the ways that you can tell this is that the English language briefly incorporated new words to describe them and their activities. And these are words um, like any leppy woman and selfold and lair white and child white. Uh, you'll be able to throw these out at the Thanksgiving dinner table and impress your relatives. Um, the first word, any leppy woman, um, is richly documented for 13th and 14th century East Anglia. So it comes from Eastern England, actually the area where Weston is and South. It derives from a gender neutral term, any leppy man. And by the way, um, I'm impressed with UMBC in all sorts of ways, but I encountered just around the corner the first gender neutral bathroom I've ever seen, um, which was uh, kind of a thrill for me. I've read about them, but never seen one before. So <laughs> hopefully that won't be my happiest memory. Anyway, gender, gender neutral names, gender neutral bathrooms, it's all the same. Um, uh, uh, it's a category, it's a term for people who are not married. It literally, literally means only man, only woman. So we, um, but also people who are not married, who are landless, and who are very loosely um, uh, connected to their communities. These people were, as one clerk in East Anglia put it, the lowest of people, and then he grumbled, he said, they're innumerable, we can't count them. Sometimes they wax in numbers and sometimes they wane. Women were so prominent among these innumerable poor people in East Anglia that from the mid-13th century, the female-specific spe term, any leppy woman, develops. And any time that you get a female-specific term developing, it tells you there are a lot of women in that category. Every extant list of these people, whether they're called any leppy women or any leppy men, includes many women, often mostly women, and sometimes all women. And here is a sample list. Um, it says, actually, I can't, uh, up there at the very top col column, um, it says Anileppi men. So this is a list that's labeled Anileppi men. And if you go through it, well, the first woman is a Matilda. Can you see her? Well, anyway. Um, uh, uh, this list has 19 uh, women in it, six men, and three children. I've looked at the history of, I've, I've tracked these people in Horsham, and I can tell you more than their names. They weren't transients. They were actually living in Horsham over many years. None of the women uh, was married or widowed, but a lot of them had children. Maybe I should say several had children. Interestingly enough, a lot of them lived with another sibling, sometimes with a brother, um, uh, more often with a sister. Um, uh, and um, these people had no land and no sheep, uh, no cattle either. Their survival depended upon what the better folk 
of Horsham considered to be reprehensible behaviors. And that's what I can see them doing in the court rolls of Horsham. What do they do? They steal wood, they steal hay, they pilfer grain at harvest, they receive and sell uh, stolen goods, they refuse to contribute to parish fundraising. Imagine that. Um, they dodge repaying debts. Uh, they engage in casual prostitution. Uh, they would have been very aggravating neighbors, I think, for fine, upright people like me. Um, but, but they were doing what they needed to do to survive. self owed is an equivalent term, but it's uh, used in a different region in northern England. Um, uh, and its, uh, its derivation is utterly unknown. Um, uh, so we don't really know what it means. I like to think it means you're holding yourself and that's all, but uh, that's just my um, ignorant fantasy. It's found in only, we only have about a dozen references to it, and it describes the poorest of the poor in the North. As one clerk casually put it, these self olds uh, these are paupers who are called self olds Who were they? We don't know. We don't actually have lists of names like we do for Annie Leppy men and Annie Leppy women. And only a, a few scattered references, all in Latin that's gender neutral, except for one instance that uses an adjective that's a female adjective. Um, so it's one of those cases where medievalists build a huge amount of stuff on one little fact. Um, and that's what I'd like to do to say that um, this term that we've taken to be gender neutral, and most historians of the English North have uh, assumed describes landless men, actually describes a category of people uh, that is, uh, includes some men, but actually rather more women. Lair White and Child White are fines that were paid in manor courts for sexual activity outside of wedlock. Uh, Lair White literally is a fine for lying down. Um, uh, and Child White is a fine for a bastard child. You'll be relieved to know that nobody had to pay both fines. Um, on some manners, uh, women were fined for lying down for fornication, and on other manners, they were fined for having bastard children. Um, so they were mutual exclusive fines. They were, in, in a sense, fines created, punishments created for just the sorts of women that I'm talking about, for Annie Leppy women and self-olds and women like Helen Wiseman in West, Weston. Um, they were levied uh, selectively on women, not men. Men are not paid a fine for fornication, uh, at least in manor courts. On poor women, more than on better off women. On local settled women, not migrant women. They didn't care if a migrant woman um, uh, wandered through pregnant, but it was a local women they worried about. And especially on uh, never married women, on single women, not on um, uh, wives or widows. I think these fines, uh, were less about morality and more about the anxiety of local good folk about the poor relief that these women and their children would need. And um, uh, their heyday is exactly the period I'm talking about, from 1250 to 1350. Once the um, Black Death sweeps through England, um, Lair White and Child White, White uh, uh, disappear uh, from manorial court records. I don't think that's because nobody's fornicating anymore. I think that's because nobody's worrying about supporting those little bastards. Um, any leppy women, self olds, and women who paid fines like Lair White and Child White were poor, desperately poor, but they were at least settled living on the margins of their communities, but still within communities. There were other women who were even less lucky and less settled. settled. And the various words that described them between 1250 and 1350 have actually dis, uh, survived in our language. Um, they were called vagabonds, by vagabonds, vacabunda in Latin, or strangers, um, extrania, extranios. Um, and we can barely glimpse these women moving through the countryside, but we can see them. They're particularly prominent um, and much more prominent than men in, in um, records that we have that describe people who are unwelcome gleaners at harvest time, poor people trying to get extra crops off the harvested fields. 
Um, they're, uh, they're often uh, noted as being um, harbored by, uh, they're, they're called uh, 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 good folk, or someone like Terry is hauled into the manor court and fined for um, uh, allowing a stranger woman to live in his house. Um, Judith, a stranger woman. Um, they're also among uh, people who are cited for being hedge burners. What's a hedge burner? Is somebody so poor that they have to take wood from the hedges uh, in order to have a fire to keep them warm or to cook with. Um, and they're also, we find these women among people who are outrightly expelled from villages and towns. Um, in Horsham, for example, uh, in the late 13th century, there's something like 150 people who are expelled. 90, 90 of them are women or their children. Some wandering single women who were unwilling or unable to settle died on the road. And we can even see these in the records that we have for late medieval England. That because uh, in Bedfordshire in the late 13th century, we have the very first surviving coroner's records, um, which tell us about unexplained deaths. And those records tell us that uh, if, you, if you sort out the poor, homeless people who are dying in Bedfordshire in the late 13th century, uh, uh, we see many more women than men. Uh, we see a, a poor woman, a stranger, as she was called, found in a ditch and presumed to have died of the cold. A migrant laborer known only as Alice, who stopped for the harv harvest in a village called Risley and was found the next morning, um, uh, uh, her brains pat battered in with a pickaxe. Um, or Emma Hatch, who begged door to door in Beeston on New Year's Day, 1274, until she was, as the coroner's records put it, seized by the cold and died. For women like Emma Hatch or Helen Wiseman or Agnes Neth, late marriage or no marriage at all were not pleasant choices born of prosperity and productive of still more prosperity. They were personal disasters wrapped in poverty. So what I'm suggesting this afternoon about the advent of later marriage and less marriage in Europe is very different from the happy narrative of girl power. I've talked about poverty, not prosperity. About children who are forced by their parents to go out and support themselves, not children being nurtured by their parents towards highly skilled work followed by prudent marriage. And I've talked to you about young people who are unable to marry and actually old people who are unable to marry too, not about people who are choosing to delay marriage or actually avoid marriage. If I'm right, the European marriage pattern, in England at least, and England is our best documented case, did not arise from girl power or the empowerment of girls, nor um, uh, did it promote further uh, uh, enhancement in the status of women. Two further points. I'd like to just point out to you very quickly that I made this argument um, in a way that is not the way people usually talk about the European marriage pattern. This is how they usually talk about the European marriage pattern. It's a demographer's topic. They use lots of, uh, look at that equation, God help us. Um, uh, and they use, um, actually that's an almost impossible to read graph. Um, this table is, is, is pretty straightforward, but they have very robust data and they collect it and they crunch it and they present it in a quantitative ways. Medievalists, including me, tried to do this in the 80s and 90s. We tried to play with the game that the demographers set out for us to do and we couldn't do it. Um, and I think it's time for us to, and basically what happened is that for the last 20 years, we've just not talked about it at all. We've just all done other things. Um, and I think it's time for us to say, look, our data's different. Um, and and uh, we can't um, play the game by these terms, but we can play the game um, uh, by logical terms. Was it easy to get land and marry uh, between 1250 and 1350 in England? No. Is it likely, therefore, that there are people who never married or married late? Yes. Can we see that in contemporary evidence? Yes, we can see it in Selfolds and Annie Lepi men and Annie Lepi women and Lair White and Garciones and so on. These are, I think, the wretched girls and wretched boys for whom marriage in Europe first became an elusive goal um, or a goal achieved late or not at all. Now, what about girl effect? If girl power did not drive the European economy in the, 14th, in the later Middle Ages and in the early modern period, might girl effect be a wrong-headed strategy in the 21st century? I fervently hope not. 
I think it's a f manifestly a good thing that NGOs are directing their resources towards poor girls. And it's also manifestly crazy to start drawing causal links across centuries and continents and cultures. Girl effect um, ne need not have worked always and everywhere to work today. But I do think that it's worth sprinkling a, a, a dose of historical perspective over girl effect. I think the girls like Emma Hatch and Helen Wiseman and Agnes Neth really wanted to marry. Um, and I think, and I think they wanted to marry as soon as they could. And I think that was a good judgment on their part. Marriage was what settled adulthood was for these girls. And it offered these girls their best hopes for lives of less poverty and more prosperity. I think it would have been hard to convince uh, most medieval girls otherwise. I also think it would be unwise to assume that if Emma Hatch and Helen Wiseman and Agnes, Agnes Neth had been trained for well-paid jobs, that they would have altruistically plowed their earnings back into their natal families and their communities and promoted economic growth in the way the girl effect uh, imagines the third world girls would do. I think if, if these medieval girls had had the skills and capital, they would have saved their money and as soon as they could, they would have bought land and married. They would have taken care of themselves, um, not necessarily their communities. And I actually think we shouldn't ask girls to take on responsibility for their entire communities. I think perhaps the larger lesson is this, and that is that in both history and in development planning, I think we should be humble about the abilities of girls and women to confound our hopes and assumptions and expectations. Yes, the historical theory of girl power makes good logical sense. Lots of people die, high wages, better opportunities for women, less marriage, therefore economic growth. It makes good sense, but it doesn't work. Um, so too, I think, uh, might be the case with girl effect, at least to some extent. Um, uh, it makes sense, but we need to be cautious about its effects. Logical sense is one thing. What actually works for girls and women is often quite another. Thanks a lot. so you should feel free to, to go if you need to, but I would like to take a few minutes to entertain questions, if uh, sure. Professor Bennett would do that. Um, oh, ah, Terry, <laughs> my husband, or were you harboring me? No, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Could, could both be true? Could, could it be that in hard times, people delay marriage, but this girl effect that they're seeing, or girl power, whatever we're calling it, could, could, al could also happen in a different, historical context in a different set of circumstances. Um, so it doesn't, ne one, one being true doesn't necessarily negate the other from being true also. Um, could you hear his question over there? Yeah. Um, yes, but I don't think so. And what I didn't go into in this paper is that um, there's been a, as I, well, I did say there's been a lot of data collected about the European marriage pattern. And the latest, um, uh, there are two uh, recent articles that uh, throw light on that question. One is, it's, it looks at women's wages over centuries, starting from about 1230. And there's no rise in women's wages after the Black Death. No, no, so there's no increased earning power for women. No, in that golden age of laborers after 1350, which is so important for this model, it's not there. The second thing is uh, there's been a really interesting article by Sheila Ogilvy and um, a co-author whose name escapes me, uh, Dennison, um, Tracy Dennison, anyway, um, that uh, 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 does this sort of thing economists do. They take hundreds of articles and pull them all together and aggregate them and crunch them in various ways. And what they basically say is the European marriage pattern is not unique to Europe. It has no relation to economic growth. It's just a happy fantasy. Um, uh, so um, uh, if I work this paper up into an article, which I hope to do, in fact, when I conclude it, I think what I'm going to say is we need to put this fantasy to rest. Uh, you know, the place we can most see it is in a place where it's not promoting economic development at all. It's an it's a, it's a effect of poverty, not opportunity. But good question, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, how does the 
see European marriage patterns play out in an area where land might not be an issue, such as an urban area, maybe London or? Um, oh, you know, I never like to talk about cities. <laughs> um, <laughs> A lot of these, uh, I think a lot of these wandering girls actually went to cities. One of the things we know about uh, medieval cities is that they had much higher numbers of women than they did of men. And medieval cities were uh, unhealthy places to live, so they relied on immigrants. Imagine that. Uh, relied on immigrants. That's a sarcastic comment about our current political situation. <laughs> okay. Relied on immigrants to um, uh, keep up their population, and they clearly got uh, attracted many more women than men. One of the big issues is there is are women going into towns because it's filled with opportunity and good things for them, or are they going to towns because they're absolutely desperate, and that's where they might be able to get. Uh, more charity or at least a little bit of work or work as prostitutes and so on. And uh, uh, we have very little evidence and so we debate that back and forth. But there are a lot of single women in towns. There's not a lot of evidence for towns in this period though. Uh, but later, there are quite a few single women in towns. Yeah. Yes? Well, on that point, the Beguine documents from the first half of the 13th century actually talk in very similar terms about the anxiety in Utrecht, the local bishop, when a group of women who are unmarried and don't have these ties uh, and, and haven't made a vow of chastity want to settle in houses with other women. Some of these women are widows. Mm -hmm. um, so this pressure seems to be, in this case on the continent, uh, a real factor. And I wonder if, there's, if, if that points away from simple issues of land to a larger phenomenon. I was thinking of, you didn't talk much about serfdom or slavery. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of recent work on slavery. I mean, is the economy becoming so open and so dynamic that the institutions cannot accommodate matching up people on the ground? Um, uh, I don't think I would take the leap you took at the end there. Um, uh, and um, uh, I'm not sure I would. Uh, be talking a lot about slavery in either England or the Low Countries in the early 14th century. But what you said about um, uh, what I call Beguines, and I'm sure you pronounce better than I have, but I'll just stick with my term. These are women who live in religious houses temporarily. They're sort of quasi nuns. Um, some single, some never married women, some widows, um, and the, and they flourish particularly in the Low Countries. Um, in the uh, 13th and early, well, the 13th century. Um, I hadn't thought about Beguines at all, but I should absolutely add that to my essay because it's, um, it's, it's an urban phenomenon um, and it's, it's evidence we have from the low countries. There's not, I think there's one hint of a Beguinage in one English town, um, but it's not an English phenomenon. Um, but it's in the East, I believe, where you're stuck. Yeah, in, in Norwich, I think, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Up oh, over there, yes. Yeah, it's just a question concerning the the nature of the, your data, uh, because the questions you're asking are the same ones that I ask myself about a different part of the world in a different period. Um, I know you said that the chart you showed was for illustrative purposes, not probative purposes. But do you have similar patterning in other records? That's one question, because you have a sample size of what uh, 200 or so there mm -hmm. of persons. Um, and in particular, do you have them from regions that aren't, that have less available farmland? Because of course, Lincolnshire, East Anglia, Cambridgeshire, all those areas are the old classic grain barren territories. And, and I'm asking that because you would think either the problem would be more acute, or you might expect there to be a shifting strategy in property devolution and age by which, at which you can inherit land and so forth. That's just a question for, for to inform me better. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, the peasants of Lincolnshire are pretty prosperous peasants. So if we're seeing stress in, in the table that I had up there, and I am seeing stress, um, I think it's likely to be um, more elsewhere. Um, uh, uh, the soil is very rich, so you can survive with relatively sm uh, smaller amounts of land. Um, this is really a unique document. Uh, there is just simply nothing like it. I mean, there's, there are two other villages near Weston that have similar lists, but they're not nearly as informative. 
Um, one of them just lists the names of the children, for example. It doesn't, I mean, this is just so great that it says, you know, Helen, Helen is a vagabond and her sister Betty is married in Spalding. It's like you just want to hug the clerk for telling you those things. Um, so there's, um, there's really nothing, nothing comparable. I'm sorry. There are actually... Uh, for a later period, when English lords and ladies become anxious about their serfs, uh, this is after the Black Death, there are some genealogies of serfs that are drawn. Um, uh, and uh, I've been working with some of those also for the Lincolnshire area, and, and I, I literally wasted a year of my life with them and concluded that the clerk was uh, more ignorant than I am about the family structures of these peasants. That he was, he was a librarian at an abbey, and I think he was just sitting there saying, well, let's marry Judith to Terry and, you know, hand him this child and so on, because <laughs> uh, it has the same surname. Uh, it's a, a really very disappointing. It was a happy year of my life, but not fruitful. <laughs> Any questions over here? I'm coming over here to offer you all a chance. <laughs> no? All right, I'll go back over here. Yeah. So, so I, I've got a two-part question. What do we know about the sort of existence of the Hajnal line at different points in time? Is the main documentation sort of after? I saw, sort of think of the John Hajnal thing as being a sort of bit after 1500 rather than before. Mm -hmm. And then related to that, I'm, I'm a bit unclear as to your explanation of the Hajnal line because I would have thought if you're doing sort of a wretchedness explanation, there was ample periods of wretchedness in areas east of the Hajnal line during the area you're looking at. Well, and um, actually, the article by Ogilvy and Dennis and I was talking about that finds those sorts of patterns elsewhere in Europe. They find it most acutely, for example, in Scandinavia, in particularly wretched economic. I mean, Scandinavia goes through some uh, horrible uh, periods, and they do find the, a really acute European marriage pattern there. Um, uh, Hatchnell, when Hatchnell drew his line, he traced it back. Uh, to the 17th century, he was pretty confident uh, that he could see it uh, in uh, this in 16, I'd say 1675 populations. Everything else he guessed about. Um, uh, and what's happened since then is he basically created a small industry for early modernists and then we medievalists who also tried to sort of pin it down um, more precisely. Um, and uh, the reason and. The Girl Power article that I put up there is a, uh, a published in a very uh, authoritative journal with a very powerful title by um, authoritative historians. And I think it is totally wrong. Um, uh, but I think it will uh, live in the imagination of historians like these things do for a, a couple of decades. Um, yes? Well, do you know anything about um, previous to the 13th century, how this, at least in England, it, what it looked like, you know, was this pattern there at all? Or, or do we? Um, it, it, that's a great question, um, but uh, 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 if you, uh, this, uh, this period, it's right here we begin to get all the documents I'm relying on. Um, and so for the, before here, the best document, uh, uh, we have uh, the Doomsday Book, <laughs> way back here, um, which is not very uh, authoritative, but manor court rolls, rentals, um, uh, um, surveys that list um, how, who holds what land in the village and so on, all of these things begin in about the 1240s. And they're not really abundant until about here. Um, as soon as things start really screwing up, that's when the people in charge are like, we need to write everything down so we know that we aren't getting messed up. Yes, that's exactly right. And it's also a period when uh, they're, uh, the lords and ladies of the manors that these peasants live on, they're actually directly managing their estates, whereas before they'd often gotten their income indirectly. And so they're, it's worth their while to hire clerks to write all these things down. Um, these are not, we have no records kept by peasants. You know, no sort of little account book that says, here I am, spinster living in the edge of the village, stole a sheep today, very tasty. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nothing like that. Questions <laughs> Well, uh, could you join me in, um, thank you, Professor Judith Bennett. Thank you, pleasure.